sound design. Advice for mixing monitors from front of house, especially six or more mixes. Number one huge tip that changed my life when I was at that venue way back in the day, mixing monitors in front of house, is splitting channels. Sound design. Welcome to Sound Design Live, the show to help you build your career as a sound engineer and the home of the world's first online career coaching program optimized for audio professionals. I'm Nathan Lively, and today I'm joined by audio engineer, educator, writer, and musician, Nicholas Radina. Wow. Nick, thanks for being here. You're welcome, Nathan. Happy to be here. <laughs> I definitely want to talk to you about your method for setting up rock solid wireless for in ear monitors on tour and the workshops in <laughs> Cincinnati. Um, but first of all, who's your favorite salsa percussionist of all time? Changuito from Cuba is definitely up there. Uh, Tito Puente. What is the next? When's the next time someone can come and see your band play or see you play? Uh, in Cincinnati, at, uh, there's an event that I do called Salsa on the Square, and um, one of the groups I play with called Tropicoso will be there uh, in a couple weeks. And also I have a small group where I play a little 10-string Puerto Rican instrument called a cuatro. Um, we'll be on, at Salsa on the Square in Cincinnati in a couple weeks. That, that group is called Zumba. This is a question I like to ask everyone, Nick. How did you get your first job in audio? I think that... Um, being a musician growing up and being the band leader, I had all the equipment and the rehearsals were at my place in my basement and I had to have the stuff. And that's kind of where I started to learn that and started to get paid, um, I guess, if you think of it like that way, of being in the band and being the sound guy and one of the musicians in the band. Um, but I think when I started really making um, kind of kind of legitimate money just doing sound. I was the uh, house guy at the uh, really cool venue here in Cincinnati called the 20th Century Theater. I was there for about 10 years. Oh wow, how'd um, you get that gig? And, um, friend of a friend actually. It was a kind of a newish uh, music venue. I mean the, the venue itself had been there for many many years. It was a beautiful art deco um, movie theater and they started doing live music at one point. And uh, I think actually a local sound company in town um, referred me to the gig. So I guess a little bit prior to that, I was working for the sound company here in town, just freelancing. And I think all that really comes down to, at least back then, was just making the effort to let people know that what you do. Like, are you an astronaut or are you a sound engineer? So at least some people understand what you do. And a lot of the times, I mean, my, one of my first breaks before the 20th century was just a friend of mine couldn't do the gig and needed a sound person and I felt like I was confident enough to maybe pull it off a little bar gig you know mm -hmm. a long long time ago and uh, I just had confidence and just went in and, and tried it and did it and I think at the end of the day a lot of those opportunities come up that way where you you're available and you're willing to do it and you're not afraid of attempting something that you might not feel 100% confident with. Yeah that's how it often goes. Well, so did yeah. you do that intentionally? Because we know now that if everyone in the world knew what we did um, and specifically what we were best at, then we would just get nonstop calls for work that we love, right? And we would just get mm -hmm. full up on that. So at that time, did you already sort of understand that more and more people needed to know what you did for you to get more work? I think so. But at that time, it was a lot. I was still playing music six nights a week. You know, I was... I was in musician mode and the sound engineering part was just kind of a side gig to a certain extent. I mean, I was still in the same industry, but I wasn't, I wasn't pursuing audio only. And you know, even today, I'm still think of myself as a musician first and then a sound engineer and other things after that, even though I spend most of my time and make most of my money um, turning knobs. <laughs> cool. So, um, so what changed for you? You were super into music. And you wanted to yep. keep doing that forever, maybe, and then you took a full-time job doing audio. But uh, kept no. doing music, I, I guess? No? I, just kept, I always kept doing music, and I started freelancing doing audio, just live audio, here and there, here and there, and here and there, and getting more experience. And, and when I started working at the, at the venue, the 20th century, it gave me a great look into all different levels of what this job entailed. I mean, that was, you know, I was the only guy there. 
there was no other production there. You know, I was doing lighting, mixing monitors in front of house, and it was events all over the map, you know, weddings, local, big local events, touring acts. And being in that environment and everything is kind of under your control and your responsibility, I think you, you tend to learn really quickly. And you also have time to experiment and make mistakes and come in early and fix things and try to figure out why something does or doesn't work. Sure. And like for me, those first three or four years there, were, were extremely important to me. Like just connecting with people, other uh, musicians in town, letting them know that I exist, but also working with larger touring acts and understanding that world. I had toured prior to that, but not at a, at a larger level like the, the shows that were happening there. Sure. So it really gave me an idea of kind of what my role is as a house guy and then what you know a touring front house or monitor engineer's role is in that environment learned a lot and I think it's really important as a sound engineer to put yourself in situations like that where you're challenged and you're not just locked into just doing a local band every once in a while I and mean, this is what you want to do you you have to kind of see the next step and kind of put yourself in the right spot to get there you worked there for a while you seem to feel like it worked out well for you because you learned a lot and it sounds like you made a lot of connections would you recommend trying to follow a similar similar path for someone else who's maybe starting out and wants to end up in a spot that you're in now doing um, touring concert sound? Yes, I think that there there is no. I mean, it's been used so many times, but experience is it. I mean, you have to you have to kind of be in the belly of the beast and do the gigs. I mean, you can. I mean, when I'm not. Back in those in those days when I wasn't doing the gig, I was still learning as much as I possibly could all the time because I was I had a passion for it. And I also felt a certain level of responsibility of getting it right and not getting it wrong <laughs> at a large level. So I think it's important for people to regardless if you do at a gig like that where you have a house gig or if you're just mixing local bands or maybe you're just getting into live sound, you just have to do the gigs and Sometimes you don't get paid, and sometimes you definitely don't get paid enough. And sometimes the work isn't as exciting as you'd like it to be, or it's frustrating or whatever, but you also have plenty of times where it all makes sense and everything kind of clicks. But experience is it. I mean, in the live world, there's, there's no time. You know, it's, it's all about reacting and coming up with solutions and being able to make decisions and troubleshoot quickly. And... The other side, if you were more of a recording engineer, you have a bit more time to get some of those things right, or you can do it again. But in live sound, you can't really do it again. So I think learning those things and understanding that speed is important and experience is important, um, and to, to care about what you're trying to help the performer do. You know, you're not, you know, you're not the angry sound man. <laughs> you know, Saying you're there to, to help. Care. Right, you have well, you have to care, and in all honesty, I mean, uh, as sound engineers, we can't really, um, you know, polish the turd. I mean, if it's a very, if what's coming off the deck isn't that good, it's hard to make it better um, on your end. But it is your job to try, you know. And if what's coming off the deck is extraordinary, then you should do everything you can to make that, make the representation the band wants to have happen, the best for the audience. But all those things kind of roll into the steps of, if you really want to do this, thinking about more than just the gear and the microphones and, and, and the consoles and all those things. I mean, with knowledge of fundamentals and the desire to be better and to represent the band and to understand the troubleshooting aspect and do the gigs, that is so far more important than the console you're using or the microphone or many other things. Looking back on what you've done so far, what do you think is the best, maybe one or two decisions you made to get more of the work that you really love? Saying no is a big one. Learning how oh, to say okay. no, it's a difficult one because you know, as a freelance, anybody, um, you know, you feel like if you say no, the phone's going to stop ringing and you, know, you don't really know where your next paycheck is and you're afraid to say no and all of that. And I've, I, still, I still deal with that now, but... Um, I think it's important to want to work with people that will better you and 
seek out the, maybe the style of music that you like, that you really, really like, as opposed to the gigs that maybe pay well, but you don't like, um, and do the work that you want to do. I think that by far, when I finally kind of let go of the reins of always saying yes and seeking out people that I want to work with, that really changed my path for sure. Um, so, so tell me more about that. Can you give me an example of saying no? I'm imagining when you were answering that question, there's probably like a story in your head of like a time when you had to say no and it was painful, but you did it and later on you appreciated it. I mean, the, the painful part is just someone handing you money and you saying, I don't want it. That's basically what that really is. I mean, in your mind, you're thinking, you know, so here's, here's $100 and I don't want it because of A, B, and C. Um, I think for me... I don't remember the specific moment, but I definitely remember the time when I was just tired of doing gigs in clubs. I was, you know, I, as a musician, I had done it for so many years, and then as a sound engineer, I was doing it again for many years, and I just felt like I had more to offer than what I was doing at that point, and realizing that it takes an effort to get out of that. So then when work would come that was more club-related, I, I would say no. And it was difficult to do, but I had faith that at the same time I was putting work into other relationships and trying to make um, other relationships work that I would hope would equal something um, bigger and better down the line. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Can you tell me a little bit about how to say no or how you approached it? It sounds like step one is have more offers coming in so that you don't feel like you're crazy. And mm -hmm. so hopefully you have some other opportunities coming in and then how, what do you say to that person? And they say, here's this gig. And you're like, oh, I know I used to do that, but now I'm not doing that. Or is it simpler well, than that? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's more polite, I think, at the same time, just to say that you're not available. Because you might be available another day. I mean, I could, a lot of stuff could drop out in my life career-wise, and I might have, might have to go back and, and those clients that I used to have and see if I can still have some work with them. So I don't really think it's uh, the best move to just say, no, I don't do that anymore, but that you're unavailable. And then eventually, <laughs> when you're unavailable four times, they might move on at that point. And it's not really, because I think that saying, no, I don't want to do that anymore, puts a negative connotation on the other side. And it's not bad for them. It's just not the right path for me at that point. So that's what I would recommend. Just, you know, you're just not available for that. Sure, and it's hard for you to predict the future because you might want to come back to them in a few more years and say, you know what, now I do want to do that again. Right. And Help. so <laughs> instead of having to like do an explanation and then like do a flip-flop, sure, just say, yep. I'm not available. Great. Yep, absolutely. Is there yeah. anything else, I kind of cut you off, is there anything else you wanted to say about maybe the decisions you'd made in your career to getting more work that you love or was, was that the main one? Well, I mean... A big turning point for me was um, when I was a house guy at the 20th century, um, a, a local band in Cincinnati named Over the Rhine, they're, they're a nationally a big band, and, and here at home they're a big band, but I'd never worked with them before, and they did two nights at this venue that I was the house guy at, and I did monitors for them. And at that point, I had been at the 20th century for maybe seven years at that point, and I was getting a little... I don't know, a little toasted being there because um, I was doing many shows a week and most of the time it was just me and maybe a lighting guy and they were oh. just, you know, very, very long days for not much money. It was important to do, but I was getting to a kind of a crossroads at that point. And, um, and over the Rhine asked me to, to come out with them on a tour that they were, they were doing in a couple months past that. Cool. And it was a big, difficult decision for me because it was... I would have to get out of a whole lot of work in order to make it work. Like it was a big chunk of time, a big tour, and and I hadn't toured at that level before. Um, but I just knew that I had to do it. It was a difficult decision, and lots and with relationships and with um, you know personal relationships and professional relationships and just work in general and and subbing out all of the work that I had and hoping that I wouldn't lose all that work when it came back. But I knew that. This was a step in the right direction. And of course it was for me in, in many, many ways, a wonderful experience, but it was still a hard one because sure. you have security and then you have, eh, I mean, this is going to be great, but who knows, you know, they could fire me after two days, you know, sure. who, who knows? So, but I just had faith that that's what was the next step in my life. So I took it. Well, I think you did 
pretty much the best thing you can do there, which is to imagine the worst possible possible scenario, which is after two days they fire you. Yeah. Um, and then you said, you know what, I'm still going to do it. Right. Absolutely. Because otherwise, how do you make those decisions? You know, you can make a list of like pros and cons, but yeah, you almost always end up going with your gut on those. Absolutely. And a side note to that story, you know, I was hired as a monitor engineer and a couple of weeks before the the tour started, the tour manager called and said they couldn't afford a tour manager or they couldn't afford a monitor engineer and a merch person. Oh, wow. And this was after I'd had, you know, gotten out of months of work. So it did happen. Yeah. So, well, kind of. <laughs> Your worst nightmare. <laughs> and, right, exactly. But, and they said, well, you know, do you want to do merch and also monitors when you can? And I didn't know anything about merch at the time. And of course I said, yeah. Wow, you know, yeah. I did that to my, you know, I, the first three or four days of that was all about me, you know, doing the best job I could selling, you know, slinging t-shirts and CDs and koozies. But, you know, five days into that tour, there was a personnel change and tour manager was not there anymore. And then they offered me the, the TM position, which I'd never done before. Oh, wow. And so at that point, I was TM, monitor engineer, and merch for a big chunk of time. And I learned a whole lot, same thing in that scenario, of being presented with an opportunity that you don't really, you don't have any experience with, but you have some sort of concept that you can do it, some sort of self-confidence that you can probably figure it out. And, and that's what I did. And that parlayed into... Obviously, me being a tour manager, them, I was front of house for them for a long time. I eventually was just a musician in the band. So the path that I took from that opportunity, which I could have just said, no, I don't want to sell T-shirts. I want to sure, be a monitor I, engineer. That's what's interesting, I think, is that another person might yeah. have said, fuck you, I'm not going to sell merch and then like, you know, try to figure something else out. I don't know. And like burn that bridge. But you yep. were on the path and decided, you know what, just I'm going to keep going. And I think it's important for you to trust yourself and know that you're surrounding yourself within an environment or people that are better than you um, or have more experience than you or you're, be, you're going to be able to experience new things because of that opportunity. And that is more important than sticking to your guns and saying, well, I'm only this. Like, I'm, I'm, you know, you wanted me as a minor engineer, so that's all I'm going to do or that's all I have skills for or something. You know, I mean, learning sound probably just the same, same case with many people on this, this live stream is that you just try things and you see if you like it. And if you figure it out, that's great. But if you're always waiting for like, well, when I'm going to be ready enough, when I'm going to be good enough to go do this or do this or do this, I mean, you're just going to miss opportunities. Because most of the time, it's really about just initiative and wanting to be good at what, whatever you're tasked to do. So, so my advice is just do it. Like, just <laughs> trust yourself, take it seriously, be professional and do it. So let's get to Steve's question because he asked that a while back. So okay. what is the difference uh, between doing a sound check for monitors when you're just doing wedges and when you are doing inner monitors? Uh, if he's asking like just a band coming on the stage and that's what's happening as opposed to, to touring with people night after night, I'm assuming he's probably referring to he's an engineer, a band comes on the stage, there's wedges and there's ears and kind of how that process works. Is that... Oh no, there he goes. He says he's a house sound man that gets a surprise in your monitor and not touring. Okay. Got it. Okay, cool. So, um, so the classic thing, a band comes in and, oh, we have an ear rack, you know, or whatever. And then you have to integrate that. Number one thing, um, if possible, is to give them a stereo mix. Stereo in ears is by far a better move than mono. Um, a simple exercise is just to put, you know, listen to mono, listen to stereo in your ears. I think it's important to know what those musicians are wanting from the ear mix, because a lot of people are still doing the one ear, one out thing, and there's a wedge on the ground, and where the wedge is and where your ear is, and if, if the wedge is pointing at the ear with the plug in or vice versa. It's not a good move to be one ear, one out. You can experiment with that also because your brain when you have one ear in, you're gonna turn your pack up. If you put both ears in, the pack is the same level, it's gonna to be too loud for you. So your brain's trying to compensate for 
what one ear is hearing that is just with no with no in ear in, and then one with a bud in, and the level is quite higher. So it's actually more damaging for you hearing wise to have one plug in, one plug out. Most people do that because they're not used to using in ears because it's you know mixing ears is a difficult task, and if it's not right as a musician, it kind of sucks. I'm sure it doesn't it can sound feel natural at all if you're just doing a transition for the first time as well. Totally, absolutely. I mean, the benefits of stage volume, the benef there's a lot of benefits to ears, but it, it's not always the best thing, you know, the best scenario. But I mean, the concept of getting ready, you know, having someone come in with, with ears, I think it's important to define, first of all, what you have to give them. Like, do you actually have enough outputs to give them what they need, A, and then B, you know, what are they expecting from that? Are wedges even necessary? Are they using wedges? Are they not using wedges? Like what, trying to find out as much information as you can about that. Um, quite often, unfortunately, a lot of times the, the ear racks that come in aren't great and the transmitters aren't great and what they're used to hearing might not be great either. And then you're coming into a situation where you're building a mix for them and you really don't know what they necessarily want. You don't even know what kind of buds maybe they have and maybe they don't have a lot of isolation. So you're, they're still getting a lot of feel from not having isolation. And some people have great buds and there's quite a bit of isolation, so. You're just trying to do this on headphones, right? You don't, they didn't bring a pack for you. <laughs> so you're yeah, guessing. I mean, I would definitely recommend um, having your own ears, even if it's just generic sure buds with, you know, foam that's not used up and, or find out from the artist kind of what buds they're using, but you definitely need to have something. I mean, headphones are okay, but realistically, if you can kind of get something a little bit closer to what they're using, that definitely helps. I mean, at my level, I definitely have to have the same buds as somebody else, but in that situation, I think it's important to have that. You know, we can go down the whole, whole road of, of mixing wedges and mixing ears, we can get into that. But I think generally when someone shows up with a rack of ears, questions are the most important thing you can ask. And then making sure that gain structure is proper between your desk and the ears. So just to list off real quick, um, Nick said, give them a stereo mix, know what the artist wants. Don't do one ear, one out if possible. Um, and do you have the gear that they actually need? So start a conversation early about that and have your own ears in ears. Yes. One of your main gigs in mixing wireless in your monitors is for the band, is it OR or OAR? <laughs> it's OAR, it's an acronym for OF A REVOLUTION. I want to get into some of your methods, but first of all, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you see people making who are new to mixing wireless in your monitors? Well, right before I mean, getting into mixing, the, one of the most important things is the RF side. So there's a lot of mistakes being made in the RF side. We can get into the RF side, but there's definitely, that will solve a lot of your problems, getting that side correct. Okay. Um, on the mixing side, as I said before, stereo is important. Like it really is important because you can gain separation, you can gain lower level by doing that. Um, I'm a big proponent of panning. You have to be careful with wireless and hard panning because the FM signal sometimes can deteriorate and, and you'll lose that hard left and right panning. But it's important to work with the panning. Um, especially on digital desks, it's way easier than analog where you can everybody can have a pan of you know, where they want it in relation to where they are on stage. You know, if I'm stage right, the bass player, the guitar player stage left, it should be coming from stage left. So try to give some people that. kind of where they're standing and where stuff is in relation to them. Um, so that's definitely important. Um, as you're mixing, if you ever watch me when I'm in monitor world, you know, my, my right hand is always on the cue fader all the time because I'm always ducking it down and listening at a much lower level than the artist is listening at. And then popping it up at their level and popping it back down. And it's important to know, just go out on the deck and, and just look at the players and where their pack volumes are and make sure nothing looks crazy, like it's all the way to 10 and your output is at two. You know, and make sure that your gain structure is proper and there's no, nothing happening there that shouldn't be happening. Um, but 
it's important because if I listened at the level the musicians listen at, I, you know, in my case with OAR, I have seven musicians I have to keep my eyes on all the time, and all of them, it sounds completely different, you know? And, um, but I couldn't listen at the level that, say, the drummer listens at the whole show. I, wouldn't, I would lose my concept of audio. Like, I, I just, my, my ears would get tired. So I'm listening a lot at a lower level. And when you listen at a lower level, you can hear things way easier. Small changes are, you can, it are much revealed at a lower level. EQ changes you can hear much better at a lower level. So definitely don't be afraid to turn it down. It's important to pop it up and make sure the level is appropriate, you know, at for for the singer or the musician that you're hearing it. But always, you know, back it down. So you're um, seeing new people sometimes just leave it up all the time, or just not even try listening at the same level that the artist is listening. Um, at. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people are just it's just it's up loud the whole time, and I mean, it might work for some people for sure, but for me personally, I can get through an hour and a half show much better. If I'm just, if I'm doing that, I'm giving my ears a break. I'm always tuned in, but, you know, I'm not ripping it. I'm not cranking it all the time. So mixing wise, those things are important. Um, panning is very important. Gentle compression is important. Um, be careful with compression in general, um, especially on singers. Um, you know, if just, you know, even if you're not a singer, just put your ears in and sing in a microphone and crank the compression down. And when it's hitting, you're not having a good day because it doesn't feel right, it doesn't feel natural. And the singer themselves are getting a lot of head voice. You know, they're, they're hearing themselves with their plugs in with nothing coming through their ears. So their concept of what they sound like is way different than your concept because you're listening to their mix, not singing and listening to their mix. So keep that in mind. So really, really careful with compression. Um, I just do light compression. I do put um, some pretty legit compression on the snare drum. I kind of parallel the snare. I'll malt the snare so I have a, a kind of a regular uncompressed snare channel. Then I have a really compressed snare channel that I'll just kind of sneak in. That way I can kind of get a bit of definition without turning the snare drum up. Okay. Um, I'll use some compression on bass and a little bit of compression on the outputs. Um, but just be really careful with that because dynamics are where it's at. And if you keep cranking the threshold down all the time, you're not helping yourself or anybody else. And whenever I come into a situation where another engineer had been there and I'm just coming in as another guy, it's the first thing I look for is where is compression hitting and what does the EQ look like? Those are the two most important things. A couple other things, uh, kind of some key things that I see mistakes happening a lot is um, open microphones, where the microphone is pointed, where it's not pointed, um, audience mics that are out of phase. I think it's important to check the phase of your stereo mixes all the time. Like I have a little plug-in that I use um, just in a DAW and I just have an output from my cue that goes into that and I can just look, glance over and cue up a mix and I can see, you know, if it's out of phase or not, you know, and if there's an issue somewhere happening because that, that happens a lot, <laughs> you know, like stuff can be wired to cables. You could grab a cable and the pins are switched and something's out of polarity and now everything's out of phase and, and you've got, you know, your problems, you know, it's all about when you're, when you're mixing ears, there's all these open microphones and you're trying to gain some sort of control over phase and, and also a time relationship. Like, uh, you know, the snare drum hits here, but the microphone's picking it up here and this microphone's picking it up at this time and this time and this time and this time. So, you're always battling with phase all the time and trying to make that a bit more coherent. So pay attention to phase is a big one. What's the plugin? Um, it's a good question. Um, I don't remember actually. Um, That's okay. You can, you yeah, can I'll uh, tell it. us later. I'll put it in the notes yeah, for the absolutely. podcast. Yep. Biggest problems that you see new people who are mixing um, inners for the first time. Problems with sonic image, so they're not sort of panning things in what makes sense for the artist on stage. Uh, pack volumes are weird, so maybe one person has their one up real high, another one has one up real low. Um, people listening at a level oh, that is not what the artist is listening at, and so you should do that, but not constantly. Um, people are making mistakes with compression that aren't natural, um, and you said dynamics are where it's at. I like that. Um, and then you, the last two things you said were open microphones and mic audience microphones that are out of phase, and so maybe that will go into 
Andy's question who said, how necessary are audience mics? There's two things with audience mics. You know, you have the desire of the musician or the performer wanting to hear the audience. And there's also the thing of hearing the room and hearing maybe more of the stage or something. So you have to kind of define what the artist wants to hear. In maybe room mics, maybe miking the room as opposed to miking the audience. Um, or treating the audience mics as room mics, that kind of thing. And it's not about picking up the audience, it's about picking up the room. Um, I think it's imperative, to be honest, to have audience mics. Yet, some musicians don't want it because maybe it doesn't sound good. So every venue is different. And while the act is on before us, I'll cue up the audience mics for me and then just take a listen and see what the room sounds like and make some corrections EQ-wise to compensate for that. You know, where, where's my high pass filter? Is there a lot of 400 in the room? I might take that out. I might even low pass it, who knows? But just trying to find, find it so it makes sense and it sounds natural. So it's very important, but I'll be writing those. So I, I'll always have a, the audience mics on a VCA so I can just push them up for everybody and push them down for everybody at once kind of thing. Some people want more than other. Absolutely, yeah, it's kind of like the, the confidence booster, you know, like the ego push, you know, like when the band comes on the stage, you're you know, great. give them some love. But then, you know, if there's too much room, they're losing definition. So, you know, in between tunes, you can ride that. But some people leave it up all the time. So it really depends on, once again, what the artist wants, not what you want. And one more thing to tie yeah. on real quick. Um, pay attention to the packs. Um, a lot of packs have different features for a limiter or high frequency boost or high gain. Whatever those things are, make sure they're consistent across all the packs, including your Q pack. So you need to make sure you're listening to exactly what the performer is listening to. And you know, I'm a firm believer in limiters, but you got to be careful with limiters on packs. Sometimes they're they're not set great. Um, there's a high frequency boost that honestly is better to boost on your end than have the pack do the boosting of the high frequency. So oh, wow, just kind of yeah, go through your packs. Dangerous. Yeah. Just make sure that it's consistent, especially when you, I, don't, I mean, some people here are touring engineers and it's a, a fly date and you have a bunch of, you know, in-ears that are provided for you, but you have no idea how they're set up. They could have been set up from the gig before. You have no idea. So I always go through there each one and just make sure everything is consistent the way I work with stuff. So. Steve asked another question, and then I want to get into wireless, Nick. So Steve said, what console are you talking about with OAR and writing the fader? OAR, uh, I'm on a Midas Pro X with them. Um, and some of the smaller stuff, I might have a Pro 2. Um, but fly dates, I'd have like a, an SC48 or Profile or, you know, a CL or a QL or a 5D or something like that, whatever. But that's basically... Um, kind of what I encounter for that specific artist. So you published this great video recently called My Sure Wireless Coordination Workflow in 120 seconds. 120 uh, seconds. I watched it, it was great. Um, you've had a lot of views on that one. So people should definitely watch that. But if you are maybe not at a computer right now, maybe you're driving, I don't know. Could you just kind of walk people through step by step what you go through in the video as well? Is that okay? Absolutely. Okay. So that video is kind of based on how I do it uh, like this past summer when I was on the road. So it's a lot of Sure gear and using Sure wireless workbench. So Free for people who don't know. Correct. Right. And um, I'm coordinating, I'm dealing with 26 to 30 channels of wireless every day, which is ears and inputs or instruments or vocals or whatever. Um, and it so makes that, sense that, video that one was, person would coordinate all of that, right? Instead of just like the front of house person taking, coordinating their uh, microphones and you coordinating the ears. Uh, yeah, it, it depends on the gig. Like this, the, this past summer, we were out with a band called Train and another artist named Natasha Bettingfield. And early, like the first couple of days of the run, we just, the monitor engineers and I, we just got together and decided how we we're going to handle wireless every day. And it, specifically in that situation, you know, Train would coordinate in the morning. I would kind of coordinate around them. They shut their stuff off during our set. I shut my stuff off during Natasha's set. So there's ways to do that. At festivals and things, there'll always be a, someone that coordinates, a coordinator sometimes, <laughs> that's coordinating for everybody. So I should probably define what coordinating is real quick. Um, 
So if you have one wireless microphone, rock and roll. You do a scan, clear channel, you're good to go. Once you get more than one, then you come into a situation where is frequency A compatible with frequency B? And there's math behind that. And you could try to do that, but computers do it way better. So when you start extrapolating that over more and more channels, you have to realize that you can't just willy-nilly pick frequencies. So in every day, honestly, is even if it's the same venue, it's important to do a scan, know what the environment is like, and then stay coordinated. So if you just have a unit like, you know, the Sennheiser, whatever, and, and it's not networked, you're not using any software or anything, um, every manufacturer has predetermined, pre-coordinated groups. So everybody calls it differently, like, you know, whatever, it's uh, Sennheiser might have, I don't know, group A channel seven or something like that. Important thing to remember is that if you have more than one microphone, you want to stay in the same group because sometimes frequency A and frequency B can combine to produce what we call an inner mod. That's another, a new frequency that didn't exist before that now is rearing its ugly head and that frequency exists. Then you, have, you add another microphone to that and now maybe there's six frequencies and you only had four before or something. So you, Yikes. you have to understand that you just can't willy-nilly pick it. So if you don't have a coordination software or anything, it's fine. Just stay within the groups. Do a scan. It'll say, whatever, five channels free. Um, do that. Leave it on. Scan your next one. Leave it on. Scan your next one. You know, if you don't have coordination. So the video was really about showing you really quickly... Um, the steps that I take using the gear that I had. So in that specific um, situation, it's important to make sure that the transmitters for your in-ears are off before you do any scanning. Usually that is either just turn the unit off or some units have a way to turn off the antenna. Just remember that with in-ears, the pack is the receiver. Because the, you know, the receivers are dumb, right? They don't know the difference between having some transmitters on that you want on and that thing being a problem. So it just knows that there's something transmitting on that frequency. So it says, we can't use that. Right, so, correct. So you just wanna make sure that before you do a scan that you, you know what the environment is. You make sure that all your own wireless is off. Um, and if you don't have a way to see it using some software, then it's important to at least make sure everything is off and your transmitters for your in-ears are off. And your transmitters like microphones and guitar packs are also off. So you're starting with a noise floor that is something resembling nothing on. Or hopefully the um, show, right? Right, so in this specific thing, I tend to coordinate ears first because um, if you think about a big pie of frequencies or a certain amount of um, bandwidth that's available, and for us, it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. FCC keeps auctioning off more and more of that spectrum. But if you think of the spectrum and the pie of frequencies that are available, uh, a wireless microphone doesn't take as much of the chunk that ears take. Ears take a bigger chunk of the spectrum, a certain a more megahertz of the spectrum. So it's important to coordinate the ears. Like for me, I coordinate the ears first, so I can I have those chunks worked out, and then I'll start coordinating inputs. You know, guitar, bass, whatever instruments and vocals. So in the video, it's very important to make sure everything is off. I usually will scan with the receiver of an in-ear pack on the stage in the position of the artist. Because um, you never know where you are and where the stage is. Other things affect RF, of course. An LED screen might affect that. Lots of things could affect that. So you want to make sure that you're in the environment that it's going to be used in. I will do a scan there. And then, depending on what what hardware piece you have, sync that pack to the receiver and to know that that exists. Turn it on, do it again for the next one. Turn it on, do it again. Or if you have a coordination software, there's other steps I can explain for that. And then once that's done, make sure all the antennas are on for your ears and then start scanning with your, your inputs, um, your, your vocal mics or your guitar packs or whatever, um, one by one. And that's kind of how I explain it in the video. Um, Without, a, without coordination software, it, it's a bit of a crapshoot because you're just relying on the data that the packs are bringing in, which is, which is great, but TV, digital TV channels are important 
and very real, and that's in the same bandwidth as our microphones and in-ears. So coordination software like Wireless Workbench, Sennheiser has their own package also. There's also web-based things. It'll give you an idea of either the ranges to not be involved with or let the computer figure it out for you. And Nick, I think it might be important to mention that even if uh, the gear that you have isn't networked or doesn't have yep. a way for you to connect to your computer, you can still use Wireless Workbench and just input it manually and it Correct. won't be as great, but you still have a way to like make a robot do the math. And so you can be a Absolutely. little bit more sure and you can get yeah. the digital TV channels and that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Yep. I mean, those, those, I saw something pop up with um, Vantage and, and other applications. It's important that it is helpful, I guess, put it that way, uh, to see the environment visually and to know where stuff is and there's tricks. I mean, when, when I'm coordinating, you know, several, 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 you know, 30 or 40 or 50 frequencies or something, it's important for me to see what it really looks like. Because you're kind of flying blind by just scanning only and just letting the software say, this is what I want to, this is what is compatible with us, or this is what has room with us. So it's important to see it. So even if you only have one unit that's networkable, and it's in the same band as maybe the rest of yours, just you know, net, network that one, and at least you can see the scan in the manufacturer's software. So you have some sort of concept of what the RF landscape kind of looks like. Donovan says, have you used the 6G RF Explorer and or Vantage software to do scans? I do, I do use the uh, little RF Explorer, although you have to be a little careful with that. I mean, you need to make sure the calibration is legit, and a lot of people will say to pad the input on the antenna of that a little bit down to kind of bring the noise floor down and to get a little bit more of an accurate scan. But still, absolutely. Unfortunately, with RF Explorer, with, without getting to the Vantage part, there really isn't a Mac version that is any, I mean, there's lots of tricks you have to do in order to kind of import it if you're on a Mac into- yeah, The workflow is not seamless right. yet, right? Totally. Um, but absolutely, because just to be able to visually see it and not have to turn on your stuff. Like when I'm on the road- You can walk around my, with it, right? Right. Well, you can walk around with it, but also my gear is still on the truck in the morning. And you, only, and I can't coordinate during set change or something. I can't coordinate, you know, I have a certain period of the day that I can coordinate and that's it. So it's really helpful to have a, like an RF Explorer um, to do a scan, just get an idea of the environment. And I may just bring that into wireless workbench or another piece of software or Vantage or whatever and see what it looks like. And then just do a kind of a general coordination and I'll kind of know early in the day, like today's going to be fine or today's going to be horrible. <laughs> <With coordination laughs> We're in downtown so, LA, today's going to be right, bad. Absolutely. And so, yeah, absolutely. So I think it's important to, to have as many tools as you want. I did a little outlay kind of of how I coordinate on the website, Sound Nerds Unite, that kind of talks about the RF Explorer product and uh, kind of how I do things. Okay, cool. Consistent basis. So if people go to soundnerdsunite.com, they'll be able to find that article. I want to tell you my worst nightmare. Okay. And see if you have anything to say about this. Got it. Because anytime I think about this, and I even had a coaching client tell me about this problem recently, and I was like, I don't know what to tell you. Like, she didn't ask me technically how to fix the problem, but I was like, man, I'm glad I'm not in that situation. So, even if we take all of the necessary precautions and we are really great about setting up our wireless and doing the coordination and we've worked things out with people, we know that there are still problems that could pop up. And I guess my worst nightmare is that I'll be working on a show alone where I'm probably like doing front of house and I did the frequency coordination in the morning, I didn't see anything, but then in like the middle of the show, I'll start hearing a problem with the wireless. Yep. I'll look over and, and see that maybe it's having like some connection issues, like all the lights are popping up and down. Is there anything I can do in that situation? Is there anything I can do during the event to sort of um, prevent that from coming up? Uh, have you been in this situation? Can sure. you save me from this nightmare? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, well, it's important. I mean, if you have the ability to have a scanner scanning during the show um, or all day or whatever, um, it kind of will give you some idea maybe of something that might have popped up. But once again, you got to remember about the coordination space and you just can't willy-nilly pick something. 
um, to solve the problem. For me personally, I always coordinate spare frequencies. Um, I'll, I'll always coordinate a spare pack. I mean, a lot, a lot of us don't have that ability to have an extra spare in-ear pack or something or a spare wireless microphone, but I always have that turned on at the ready at showtime. So if I had to, if I'm, I, because the, the issue with changing frequencies, at least with gear other than high, high level wireless stuff is that you have to physically have the pack or the microphone back from the performer to change the channel. Right, and there's some newer stuff where it can do that for you from the transmitter, and that's amazing because that kind of solves this question of like, I have a problem, I don't know what it is, okay, I'm gonna switch to the spare frequency, boom, also set the transmitter. Otherwise, with your older legacy or you know even some equipment, you can't do that anymore. So, sorry, continue. Totally. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, so in, in my case, I can't go out during the middle of the show, grab the pack, and then take a minute even to sync it and bring it back. Like I'm, I'm not gonna put, I'm not gonna stop the show for that. So personally for me, my punt always is to have a spare output that I can route, that anything can be routed to. So basically it's on a matrix and I can just send any group I have or aux I have to that matrix at any moment and I'm able to send whatever mix that is to the spare pack, which has already been coordinated and free, you know, interference free. And I'll oh, cool. just so have that. you're not that. building a mix again, you're just sending an already made mix. Got yep, it. you got it. I'll just send whoever, you know, whoever's going there to that and I'll take the pack and I'll just flip the pack out. You know, they, you know, I'll sneak up behind them, pop, pop, and make sure you don't have it cranked when you, you know, put the pack in. But so, I mean, for me and for others that have that ability, that's one way to do it. But it's really important during, like maybe before the show, to make sure all your transmitters are off and look at the RF level. That's one thing I forgot to mention in, the, in this video. I mean, I mentioned in the video, but as we were just talking about it, it's important to keep everything off and then just look at the, turn the receivers on and just look at them. Are they showing RF? And after you've coordinated, turn everything off again and look at the receivers. Are they receiving any RF? Stuff like that can pop up. So maybe before the show happens, make sure all your stuff is off. Look at it, make sure it's okay. Caveat there is when you're doing festival or some bigger things, you wanna kinda of keep the wireless on all the time. Burn batteries all day long because while other people are scanning, you want them to take yours into consideration because you have no idea when someone else is gonna fire up some no. on another stage somewhere you know that is one of the only strategies that i know about show up early turn yours on maybe high power if you need to and just make sure they're on all day right yeah absolutely totally so you know unfortunately you know we, we can't really uh, predict um when stuff is going to get turned on or not the meaning stuff we don't have control over but a buddy of mine who actually i think was on here chuck smith who's, a, who's also a great rf coordinator you know, he told me, you know, be, be careful of like, you know, those handheld ticketing machines that only come on when ushers fire them up, you know, at doors. Like, just ask the environment, what's going on? Anything I need to know about, you know, with wireless? Is there any, is there any house wireless that I don't know about? And if there is, then you coordinate around that or have them turn it on as you coordinate. So you take that into consideration. So just ask questions and that'll hopefully prevent those kind of things from happening. And when they do happen, you got to have a, a punt worked out. I mean, you have to coordinate backup frequencies, period. Always coordinate backup frequencies. And if you have another device, another microphone or whatever, a spare, always have it on, coordinated and ready to go. I mean, other oh. than that, <laughs> you'll have to step up to an Axion or something like that where it's switching to a backup for you automatically, you know. But that, you know, it's quite a bit more money than I think sure. a lot of us have, so... So Donovan had another question. He said if you have any plans moving forward with um, the loss of 600 band in the next two years. Uh, it's a tough one. I mean, manufacturers are definitely doing what they can to, to get into a space that maybe doesn't rely on UHF. You know, VHF is a thing. Um, I think manufacturers are definitely looking into ways to handle this because honestly, the slice of the pie is getting thinner and thinner and thinner and thinner. And unfortunately, even with the lobbying that this industry has, I don't know. 
you know, and it's tough. I, I work with a lot of theater groups and, you know, they make big investments in wireless. You know, there might be 24 or 30 channels of wireless. And then they find out five years later they need to sell it, you know, which is difficult, you know, because you have to sell it to either another country that doesn't have um, these restrictions or send it back to the manufacturer and get a rebate, but you're still spending some more money again. So you got to be really careful with that. Um, how I am dealing with it is just trying to keep my ear close to the ground. I do recommend people buying stuff as low as possible because um, they keep hacking off from the top down. So the lower you go, the safer I feel like you'll be for the longer period of time. I wish I could give you a better answer than that, but I'm not the FCC. So. Sure. <laughs> When you first started working with OAR, were there some big problems you had to solve when you first came on board, or are there any techniques you developed while working with them that you could share with uh, us? They're similar to others that I've worked with that, you know, you're coming into a gig where there's another guy before you, and you don't know much about the band, you don't know much about that person's workflow, and in the digital age, we're usually working off somebody else's file to at least give us an idea of kind of where things are. I think it's for me, it's very important to take a real close listen to what people are wanting from either their wedge or their ears. I mean, it's important to, like I have notes from the first couple gigs as OAR as an example, where I'd write down like, what are the things that I hear right off the bat? Like his vocal is really loud and something else is really low. Like just defining like broad strokes what this person likes or what this person doesn't like. I mean, over time you learn, so when you have to build a mix, Sometimes you have a, an idea of what the person wants. Um, but it's important to kind of know that ahead of time. Um, and that's a, that's a trap for young players because you might come into the situation and build a mix based on what you think sounds good. And what you think sounds good is completely relative, <laughs> or, or sorry, objective, because we all hear differently and we all have different levels of hearing loss. We all hear, want to hear things differently. And it's not up to us to force what, you know, what sounds good to us on somebody else. I mean, there's definitely plenty of mixes that I mix that I'm not a big fan of, but that's what they're most comfortable with. And if they come to you and say it sounded great, then, then it sounded great. Regardless of if you thought it sounded great or not, it sounded great for them. So understanding everybody hears differently and it's important that you, you don't just put your stamp on things, that you're there to listen to what they have. Um, I know the first year or so with, with OAR, kind of figuring out stage volume and, and giving people what they want when you don't have anything left to give kind of things. Um, you know, kick drum is a big one. OAR, as an example, you know, in order to kind of to reduce some of the low, low frequency energy on the stage, you know, for the bass player, he has his rig, his, you know, eight by 10 rig. And he also has a double 18 um, fill behind him, plus a wow. wedge, plus his ears. Wow. <laughs> right. And he wants to hear the kick drum. I mean, he wants to feel and hear the kick drum. And you have to be careful when there's more devices producing frequency at the same time that maybe the bass player is completely in a null. And when that sub is hitting and the PA is hitting and the wedge is hitting, maybe they're not time aligned and maybe it's a complete cancellation of where that person is. So it's important for me at that point to stand out there and hear or feel what they're hearing or feeling, and either if you have the ability to flip the polarity on something or start changing the delay on something to make that feel better is important. Um, Mike Larcy, their, their, their production manager of Front of House, he recommended um, going to these plates. Um, Porter Davis, I think, is the company. Okay, did you try that? Yeah, so we have, you know, we have two, they're like, I don't know, three by three plates that vibrate that he stands on. Um, and I just send kick drum and a little bit of bass to that mix. That, and, allow, that uh, allow you to reduce some of the speakers or some of the SPL? Yeah, it definitely reduced some of the, uh, reduced what I was putting into the sub and we got rid of the wedge. Um, same thing happened with the drummer. When I came into the gig, you know, he had his ears, he had a, a thumper for his stool and he also had you know, a double 18 behind him. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's a big rock band. So sure. there's, there's, there's a level of expectation that you want, you want the musicians, the performers to feel good and you're, you want to help them do that. But um, the, the drummer was struggling one time with just feeling the kick drum and I just turned off the subs and it made all the sense in the world. We got rid of the subs. So now there's less 
energy coming off the stage now because we're getting rid of things and really focusing on why the person isn't hearing. So I guess those are the kind of the challenges or, or the workflows that I, I come into. And it's, it's really important to try to get a, an overview of what people want, what stuff looks like, and go out there and be stand in the person's position and hear what they're hearing or feeling or whatever. Because, you know, standing in front of a, guitar, a twin, a Fender twin on four even, cranking, it doesn't sound the same to you as it does you out there on the stage playing it, like standing in front of this amp, as opposed to being in monitor world where you're not standing in front of the amp. Yeah. So you might think the guitar player needs a whole lot more guitar, but maybe they don't. Maybe their, their vocal mic is picking up the guitar and that's all they really want. Yeah. So it's important to, to see what's contributing to the mix. And that's what coming into any gig like that is important to, to understand. Just don't stay in your little cocoon over there, your little monitor beach the whole time. Well, Nick, I really appreciate your attitude of like continuing to try and make it better. And, and I'm sure the first time you got into this, some of the situations, you're like, oh my God, how's this going to work? But you notice that as right. you kept working on it, kept thinking about solutions and kept talking to people and showing that you cared and like, let me stand here and listen to this and let me show you that like, this is what we're doing. I'm, mm -hmm. So I appreciate that. It's great. Yeah. And, and another little side note is that everybody doesn't speak the same language that you speak. You know, a friend of mine that was just out with uh, Eric, he was working with an artist and, and the artist would, would tell him what she wanted in colors. <laughs> okay. Can I have more brown or more blue or something? And Got it. at first he was like, you're crazy, but he learned what she meant by that. You know, and when she said, I need more red, that means this. You know, he's like, well, you know, what does this sound like? Red, okay then kind of figure those things out. So just because you're, you're a highly technical person speaking a language and you go to an artist and the person says it sounds too tinny or something. And, and I remember in my early days when someone would say that to me, I would think, oh, they don't know what they're talking about. I know what I'm talking about, you know, but it's not, no. I mean, it, you need to learn how to translate what that means. Tinny to them means this. So now you can speak the same language. So, you know, don't just come across to them as, I'm the sound person, I know what sounds right or doesn't sound right. We all hear differently, and your job is to make the performers feel as comfortable as they can so they can perform the best they can. That's the key. At the end of the day, it's all that matters. Well, let me ask you about your workshops, Nick. So, um, yep. I knew you teach some workshops in Cincinnati and I think some other places. So. What do you think is the most valuable thing that you teach in your workshops? I think that the thing that people come away with most of the time that, that affects them, and, it may, and at first I didn't think it would. At first I didn't think that that would be the most important thing, but I try to demonstrate um, the concept of kind of, of seeing sound, especially with low frequency, and you can speak a lot to this, um, kind of understanding visually, graphically, what is happening, like with low end as an example, or where your speakers are pointing and what does 60 by 90 really mean and where is that sound really going and and they're, they're surprised i have a little device where i can kind of show with some lasers of where dispersion is and if you have a regular speaker on a stand and the dispersion is hitting the ceiling and the ceiling is metal maybe you should tilt it down but maybe you didn't know that until you started visualizing kind of where sound is it's going. I mean, to a certain extent, obviously, high frequency is very directional, and the lower you go, the more omnidirectional it is. But still, that I think was a big eye opener for a lot of people. So that, that's number one for sure. Um, this is not a technical thing, but I think that having the people together in the same room is incredibly beneficial to everyone. Um, the first workshop I did, you know, at the, at the beginning of the class, I just had everybody, everybody introduce themselves to one another and. I asked how many people did not know someone else here and all the hands went up. It was this moment of like, for whatever reason, I was able to bring these people together that didn't know each other, that live in the same city, that like the same stuff. And like, that is really, really important. And not just from a technical side, but also a career side of, well, maybe I can get work with this person or I didn't know this person did this or whatever. So the networking benefit of physically being in the same space or even, even online, the, the third thing is just, um, I do a thing where I'll, I'll, uh, I'll have, I call it the crappy speaker <laughs> and the good speaker. And I, for this workshop, I had uh, like six consoles set up. I had a little, like a Mackie 1202, 
a, a little analog Venice, a Personas, like all the way up to like a Yamaha CL. I did some fancy routing and I basically routed the same signal to all of them and the return from that came back to me and then I routed that to a crappy speaker and a good speaker. And I was able to show people the small differences sonically sometimes um, between consoles or just let them figure it out for themselves and also how important the speaker is. Um, you know, I had a you know, $25,000 console going into a PV Backstage 30 guitar amp. And then I had a 1202 going into a really nice Nexo. And just that moment of clarity of like, out of all this stuff that, that's here, what matters most technically, not from the talent performer side and the room side, are the speakers. You know, it really, really does matter where the speakers are pointed and the quality of the speakers and if they're powered correctly and stuff. So those are big takeaways that I saw in my, my reviews after. Okay, so Steve said, um, what do you bring to eat on long gigs? Uh, peanut butter. You, you definitely will see me with a can of peanut butter and a, and a spoon in my bag quite a bit. I I'll always have like a granola bar, or stuff like that in there. Apple, I usually have a couple apples. That's kind of about it. I mean, for me, it's, it's about getting protein somehow as quickly as possible and fat as quickly as possible because uh, we definitely forget to eat or don't get time to eat or the options to eat are not wonderful options. So hopefully there's catering and everything's cool, but there's plenty of gazillions of gigs I've done where peanut butter was the name of the game. So, so Andy also asked, um, advice for mixing monitors from front of house, especially six or more mixes. It's scary. Num number one huge tip that changed my life when I was at that venue way back in the day, mixing monitors in front of house. Same thing, I had five mixes, but still, is splitting channels, Y cables. I mean, I, I was on an analog desk there, so you can use Y cables for digital also, or just soft patch. But the key thing to remember is that when you're mixing for the audience, you have that sound system, which is not the same sound system, and not the same speakers as the wedges are, and the ears are. So when you start making EQ changes on your desk and, you know, say it's post-fader or pre-fader, you don't really, you know, whatever that is, you're making changes based on what you feel like needs to be heard in the audience. And that in turn could affect what the musician is hearing on the deck. Um, so that's number one, to be able to, to basically, you're, you're kind of creating a little monitor console and a front of house console on your front of house console. Traditionally, there is a split on the deck, inputs go to the monitor guy, inputs go to the front of house guy. They can do whatever they want with them. They're not gonna affect one another, aside from gain sometimes with the, in the digital world. But still, that's what you're trying to do. So I'll always take vocal channels and Y them and like acoustic instruments, like acoustic guitars, just important inputs, they need to be split. Um, just remember to unassign that channel from your left and right and you're feeding your monitor sends from that send. I'll put it in post fader mode, everything's in post fader. And that way you're EQing the source, you're not EQing the mix. You know, if you've got a classic situation of um, a singer songwriter and uh, you know, she's, she's playing an acoustic guitar and she's singing and there's a wedge mix and she's playing her acoustic and it really sounds bad and you start going to the graphic and you start hacking the graphic up to make the guitar sound good. And then she starts to sing and then that's terrible. So the output EQ or the graph or the parametric, whatever you have in our output, should be to make the wedge or the ears, mainly the wedge, honestly, sound natural to you first. And then you use a strip EQ or channel EQ to make the input sound correct. So stop hacking the output EQ, split channels, and, and do it on the strip. I hope that makes sense. I talk about that in some other articles and stuff, but I hope that'll help you because that was a big thing. And then the next thing real quick is if you can get a wedge out at front of house. So a Q, Q, Q wedge, just like we have in monitor world. So as I'm bringing a mix up, I can hear it exactly what the person is hearing. Because if you're 30, 40, 50 feet away from the deck and you're trying to mix monitors in front of house, you're just looking at the guy like, is that enough? Does that sound good? I don't really know. I'm just turning the knob. So. Get the same wedge, powered the same. If it's a powered thing, cool. If it's, if it's not, just make sure it's the same thing at front of house and put it on your queue, your output, and do it like that. that. That changed my life when I learned those concepts. Nick, where is the best place for people to follow your work online? 
So Sound Nerds Unite is, is kind of where I have a home base for you know, signing up for workshops. Um, I also will publish other smaller articles that I don't write um, that aren't published in Pro Sound Web or Live Sound International. Just some shorter articles that maybe address a very specific thing. And then I, I link to everything from there. So that's a great place to find me or, of course, here on Facebook. I, I put together a quick little uh, kind of article about the RF wireless thing that okay. I'll, uh, that you guys can get from me. Just go soundnerdsunite.com or .org. There's a little sign-up box there, and I'll send that to you. So I know I kind of whipped through some concepts um, a little bit too quickly, so um, don't sweat worrying about taking notes for that. Um, just sign up for it, and I'll send it your way. Yeah, we covered so much stuff here, and I took a few notes, but I'm sure there's a lot of things I didn't cover, so I'll want to get that as well. Yeah, and feel free to reach out to either of us. I mean, I, I'm happy to answer any questions whenever. Do not reach out to me. Actually, not Nathan, but me. <laughs> you see. <laughs> Just kidding. Sound design.